Section number 87 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. The Reward of Crime. At half past eleven on the following morning, Mr. Torrens entered the office of Mr. Howard, the solicitor. His countenance wore a smile of satisfaction. In spite of the various events which had lately occurred to harass him, for he was about to receive a large sum of money, and his fingers itched to grasp the banknotes and the gold which he had seen stowed away in the safe on the preceding day. He already beheld his debts paid, his mind freed from pecuniary anxieties, and his speculations prospering in a manner giving assurance of the realization of a splendid fortune, and these pleasing visions with which his imagination had cheered itself during the drive from the cottage to the attorney's office, naturally tended to bestow on his countenance the expansiveness of good humor. And, after all, it is a pleasant thing to enter a place where one is about to receive a good round sum of money, even though the amount will not remain long in pocket, but must be paid away almost as soon as fingered. Mr. Torrance had never felt more independent than he did on this occasion, and the look which he bestowed upon a poor beggar woman with a child in her arms, as he ascended the steps leading to the front door of Mr. Howard's abode, was one of supreme contempt as if a pauper were indeed a despicable object. Well, Mr. Torrens entered the office with a smiling countenance, but he was immediately struck by the strange aspect of things which there presented itself. The place was in confusion. The clerks were gathered together in a group near the window, looking particularly gloomy and conversing in whispers. Several gentlemen were busily employed in examining the japanned boxes which bore their names and contained their title deeds, and two or three females were weeping in a corner and exchanging such dimly significant observations as, Oh, the rascal, the villain, to rob us poor creatures. Mr. Torrens recoiled, aghast and speechless, from the contemplation of this alarming scene. A chill struck to his heart, and in common parlance, any one might have knocked him down with a straw. Good heavens, gentlemen! he exclaimed at length recovering the use of his tongue what is the meaning of this ask those youngsters there sir said one of the individuals engaged in examining the tin boxes and the speaker pointed towards the clerks in a manner which seemed to imply that the news were too shocking for him to unfold and that it was moreover the duty of the lawyers as subordinates to give the required information well gentlemen what is the matter demanded Mr. Torrens, turning to the clerks. Has anything sudden happened to Mr. Howard? Oh, very sudden indeed, sir, was the answer vouchsafed by one of the persons thus appealed to, and accompanied by a sinister grin. Is he dead? inquired Mr. Torrens, his excitement now becoming absolutely intolerable. No, sir, he isn't dead exactly, but— But what? cried Torrens, trembling from head to foot. He's bolted, sir was the astounding answer. Absconded, murmured Mr. Torrance faintly, and reeling like a drunken man, he would have fallen had he not come in contact with the wall. Yes, it was indeed too true. Mr. Howard, the cold, phlegmatic, matter-of-fact, business-like lawyer, had decamped no one knew whither, though numbers had to mourn or course his flight. Are you ill, sir? inquired one of the clerks at the expiration of a few moments for Mr. Torrens was leaning against the side of the room, his countenance pale as death, his eyes rolling wildly in their sockets, and his limbs trembling convulsively. No, no, I shall be better in a minute, groaned the unhappy man. But this blow is cruel indeed, he gasped in a choking voice. Two thousand pounds! Ruin! Ruin! Ah, there's many who will be ruined by this smash, sir said the clerk you're not the only one and that's a consolation a consolation indeed 
it was none for mr torrens who saw himself ruined beyond all hope of redemption ruined in spite of the immense sacrifices he had made to avert the impending storm the sacrifice of his daughter's innocence to sir henry courtenay and the sacrifice of himself to an abandoned and profligate woman miserable miserable man what hast thou earned by all thine intriguings thy schemings thy black turpitude and thy deplorable self-degradation oh better better far is it to become the grovelling whining beggar in the streets than to risk happiness character name honour all on such chances as those on which thou didst reckon and now behold him issue forth from that office into which he had entered with head erect self-sufficient air and smiling countenance behold him issue forth bent down crushed overcome ten years more aged than he was a few minutes previously and an object of pity even for that poor beggar woman whom ere now he had treated with such sovereign contempt miserable miserable man has not thy punishment commenced in this world is there not a hell upon earth and is not thy heart already a prey to devouring flames and thy tongue parched with the insatiate thirst of burning fever and thy soul tortured by the undying worm oh how canst thou return to thy house in the vicinity of which lies interred a corpse the discovery of which may at any time involve thee in serious peril how canst thou go back to that dwelling whence thine injured daughter has fled and over the threshold of which thou hast conducted a vile strumpet as thy bride when we consider how fearfully we are made how manifold are the chances that extreme grief sudden ruin and overwhelming anguish may cause a vessel in the surcharged heart to burst or the racked brain to become a prey to the thunderclap of apoplexy it is surprising it is truly wondrous that man can support such an enormous weight of care without being stricken dead when it falls upon him and yet to what a degree of tension may the fibres of the heart be wrung ere they will snap asunder and what myriads of weighty and maddening thoughts may agitate in the brain ere reason will rock on its throne or a vein burst with the gush of blood in the meantime occurrences of importance were taking place at torrens's cottage mrs torrens late mrs slingsby was whiling away an hour in unpacking her boxes and disposing of her effects in the wardrobe and cupboards of her bedchamber congratulating herself all the time on the success which her various schemes had experienced she had obtained a husband to save her from disgrace and that husband had set out to receive as she fancied a considerable sum of money which would relieve him of his difficulties and enable him to pursue his undertakings in such a manner as to yield ample revenues for the future she was moreover rejoiced that rosamond had quitted the house for shameless as this vile woman was she could not have failed to be embarrassed and constrained in her new dwelling had that injured girl met her there while mrs torrens was thus engaged with her domestic avocations and her self-gradulatory thoughts in her bedchamber the stable-boy who had been hired on the preceding day was occupying himself in the garden well what do you think of your new missus he said to the maid-servant who had just been filling a stone pitcher at the pump in the yard she seems a decent body you know was the reply but i haven't seen much of her yet what are you doing there harry why you must know that i'm rather a good hand at gardening answered the lad desisting from his occupation of digging a hole in the ground and resting on his spade and i'm going to move that young tree to this spot here because it's all in the shade where it stands now and will never come to no good ah that's one of the young trees that jeffreys planted him who went away so suddenly yesterday morning and which made me come and fetch you to help us here observed the maid but come go on with your work she added laughing and let me see whether you really know how to handle a spade well you shall see returned the boy and he fell to work again with the more alacrity because a pretty girl was watching his progress but i'll tell you fairly he said after a few minutes's pause in the conversation this digging here is no proof of what i can do 
because the ground is quite soft and the more i dig the surer i am that the earth has been turned up here very lately that i'm certain it has not exclaimed the maid-servant but i say that it has though persisted harry look here how easy it is to dig out do you think i don't know you fancy yourself very clever my boy said the female domestic laughing but you're wrong for once we had no man-servant here before jeffreys come and he never dug there i declare now i'll just tell you what i'll do for the fun of the thing cried the lad i'll dig out all the earth as far down as it has been dug out before because i now can see that a hole has been dug here he added emphatically you're an obstinate fellow to stand out so said the maid but i'll come back in five minutes to see how you get on the good-natured servant hastened into the kitchen with the pitcher of water in her hand and the lad continued his delving occupation in such thorough earnest that the perspiration poured down his forehead by the time the maid-servant returned to the spot where he was digging he had thrown out a great quantity of earth and had already made a hole at least three feet deep still hard at work she said why you have made a place deep enough to bury that little sapling in and what a curious shape the hole is to be sure just for all the world like as if it was dug to put a dead body in i wish you wouldn't go on digging in that way harry i shall dream of nothing but graves a cry of horror bursting from the lips of the boy interrupted the maid-servant's good-natured loquacity what is it harry she demanded peeping timidly into the hole from which the boy hastily scrambled out you talk of dead bodies he cried shuddering from head to foot and with a countenance ashy pale but look there a human hand the maid shrieked and darted back into the kitchen uttering ejaculations of horror mrs torrens heard those sounds of alarm and hastily descended the stairs oh missus cried the boy whom she encountered in the passage leading from the hall to the back door of the house such a horrible sight oh missus what shall we do what will become of us speak explain yourself said mrs torrens amazed and frightened at the strange agitation and convulsed appearance of the boy oh missus he repeated his eyes rolling wildly his countenance denoting indescribable terror in that hole there a dead body a man's hand merciful heavens shrieked mrs torrens now becoming dreadfully agitated in her turn for rapid as lightning flash did the thought strike her that the corpse of sir henry courtenay was discovered yes missus tis a man's hand peeping out of the earth continued the lad and i'm afraid i hacked it with the shovel but i'm sure i didn't mean to do no such thing the newly married lady staggered as those frightful words fell upon her ears and a film spread over her eyes but a sudden peremptory knock at the front door recalled her to herself she ordered the trembling maid who was now standing at the kitchen entrance to hasten and answer the summons the moment the front door was opened two stout men shabby genteel in appearance and smelling uncommonly of gin and peppermint walked unceremoniously into the hall is mrs torrance at home my dear said one who carried an ash stick in his hand cause if she is you'll please tell her that two gentlemen is waiting to say a word to her what name demanded the servant maid by no means well pleased at the familiar tone in which she was addressed oh what name repeated the self-styled gentleman with the ash stick well you may say mr brown and mr thompson my dear i am mrs torrens gentlemen said that lady who having overheard the preceding dialogue now came forward and i suppose that you are the persons sent by the auctioneer about the sale of my furniture in old burlington street well not exactly that neither ma'am returned the individual with the ash stick the fact is we're officers officers shrieked the miserable woman an appalling change coming over her yes and we've got a warrant agin you for forgery ma'am added the bow street runner who was no other than the readers' old acquaintance mr dykes mrs torrance uttered a dreadful scream and fell senseless on the floor come young woman bustle about and get your missus some water and vinegar and so on exclaimed dykes here bingham my boy lend a helping hand and we'll take the poor creature into the parlor the two officers accordingly raised the insensible woman and carried her into the adjacent room where they deposited her on the sofa 
that sofa which had proved the deathbed of her paramour in the meantime the servant-maid though almost bewildered by the dreadful occurrences of the morning hastened to procure the necessary articles to aid in the recovery of her mistress and in a few minutes mrs torrens opened her eyes gazing wildly around her she exclaimed where am i then encountering the sinister looks of the two runners she again uttered a piercing scream and clasping her hands together murmured my god my god for a full sense of all the tremendous horror of her situation burst upon her and there was a world of mental anguish in those ejaculations she's a fine woman whispered dykes to his friend while the good-natured servant endeavoured to console her mistress yes she be replied bingham what a pity tis that she's sure to be scragged so it is added mr dykes and now you stay here old chap while i just make a search about the place to see if i can find any of the blunt raised by the forgery thus speaking the officer quitted the room oh ma'am pray don't take on so said the good-natured servant-maid endeavouring to console her mistress it must be some mistake i know it is you never could have done what they say i wish master would come home he'd soon put him out of the place my god my god what will become of me murmured mrs torrens pressing her hand to her forehead oh what shall i do what will the world say just heavens this is terrible terrible at that moment the parlour door was opened violently and mr dykes made his appearance dragging in the lad harry who was struggling to get away and blubbering as if his heart were ready to break hold your tongue you damned young fool cried dykes giving him a good shake which only made him bawl out the more lustily no one ain't no one ain't going to do you no harm but we must keep you as a witness bless the boy i don't suppose you had any hand in the murder these last words brought back to the mind of mrs torrens the dread discovery which had ere now been made in the garden and the remembrance of which had been chased away by the appalling peril that had suddenly overtaken her but at the observation of the bow street runner to the boy she uttered a faint hysterical scream and fell back in a state of semi-stupefaction murder did you say old fellow demanded bingham yes summit in that way returned dykes at all events there's a man with his throat cut from ear to ear lying at the bottom of a hole in the garden you don't mean to say he was left all uncovered like that exclaimed bingham no no answered dykes them as did for him buried him safe enough and it seems that this boy has been a digging there and comes down to a hand sticking out of the ground so he's too much afeard to go down any further but i deuced soon shoveled out the earth and behold ye there lies the dead fullest spectacle you ever see bingham in all your life but it won't do to waste time in talking here you cut over to streetham and get a couple of constables cause there's plenty of work for us all in this house it seems bingham departed to execute the commission thus confided to him and dykes remained behind in charge of the premises it would be impossible to describe the wretchedness of the scene which was now taking place in the parlour the lad harry was crying in one corner despite the assurances which dykes had given him the maid-servant horrified and alarmed at all the incidents which had occurred within the last quarter of an hour was anxious to depart from a house which circumstances now rendered terrible but she could not make up her mind to leave mrs torrens who was in a most deplorable condition for the unhappy woman lay gasping for breath and moaning piteously on the sofa her countenance distorted with the dreadful workings of her agitated soul and her eyes fixed and glassy beneath their half-closed lids dykes accosted the boy and was beginning to put some questions to him with a view to ascertain when it was likely that mr torrens would return when that gentleman suddenly drove up to the door in his gig now my lad said dykes go and open the door and mind don't utter a word about what has taken place here this morning the boy hastened to admit mr torrens who passed by him without even appearing to notice his presence and proceeded straight to the parlour in a mechanical kind of manner which showed how deeply his thoughts were occupied with some all-absorbing subject but the moment the ruined wretched man opened the door he shrank back from the scene which offered itself to his view for the condition of his wife and the presence of so suspicious-looking a person as mr dykes told the entire tale at once 
the forgery had been discovered oh master exclaimed the servant maid i'm so glad you come back for your poor dear lady yes master and that dreadful sight in the garden interrupted the boy whimpering again the murdered man in the hole mr torrens staggered reeled and would have fallen had not dykes caught him by the arm saying sit down sir and compose yourself i'm very sorry that i should have been the cause of unsettling your good lady so sir but i'm obliged to do my duty and as for t'other business in the garden i suppose i presume you are an officer cried mr torrens suddenly recovering his presence of mind as if he had called some desperate resolution to his aid that's just what i am sir answered dykes and you have come here to 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 arrest mrs slingsby that was mrs torrings that is for forgery was my business in the first instance continued dykes and now it's grown more serious cause of a orchard discovery made in the garden what demanded torrens with strange abruptness but he was a prey to the most frightful suspense and was anxious to learn at once whether any suspicion attached itself to him relative to that discovery the nature of which he could full well understand the dead body the murdered gentleman master exclaimed the lad harry throwing terrified glances around him i do not understand you said mr torrens in a hoarse hollow tone what do you mean all this is quite strange and therefore the more alarming to me but the ghastly pallor and dreadful workings of his countenance instantly confirmed in the mind of dykes the suspicion he had already entertained namely that mr torrens was not ignorant of the shocking deed now brought to light and the officer accordingly had but one course to pursue mr torrens sir he said the less you talk on this here business perhaps the better cause every word that's uttered here must be repeated again elsewhere and it will be my duty to take you afore a magistrate take me ejaculated the wretched man and his eyes were fixed in horrified amazement on the officer i'm sorry to say i must do so answered dykes martha martha ejaculated torrens starting from the seat in which the officer had just now deposited him and speaking in such wild unearthly tones that those who heard him thought he had suddenly gone raving mad why do you lie moaning there get up and face the danger bravely bravely ah ah here is a fine ending to all our glorious schemes and he laughed frantically howard has run away absconded gone i tell you yes gone with the two thousand pounds but i did not murder sir henry courtenay he continued abruptly reverting to the most horrible of all the frightful subjects which racked his brain no it was not i who murdered him you know it was not martha and he sank back exhausted and fainting in the seat from which he had risen sir henry courtenay cried dykes well this is strange for it's on account of forging his name that the lady is arrested and notice of his disappearance was given at our office this morning late that evening the entire metropolis was thrown into amazement by the report that a gentleman named torrens who had hitherto borne an excellent character and was much respected by all his friends and acquaintances had been committed to newgate on a charge of murder the victim being sir henry courtenay baronet and this rumour was coupled with the intelligence that the prisoner's wife to whom he had only been married on the previous day and who was so well known in the religions and philanthropic circles by the name of slingsby had been consigned to the same gale on a charge of forgery end of section eighty seven section eighty eight of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter 84. Old Death's Party. While these rumors were circulating throughout the metropolis, Old Death was preparing for the reception of visitors at his abode in Horsemonger Lane. The aged miscreant, assisted by the old woman who acted as his housekeeper, arranged bottles, glasses, pipes, and tobacco on the table, made up a good fire so that the kettle might boil by the time the guests should arrive, and carefully secured the shutters of the window in order to prevent the sounds of joviality from penetrating beyond that room. When these preparations were completed, 
the old woman was dispatched to the nearest cook-shop to procure a quantity of cold meat for the supper, and shortly after her return with the provender, the visitors made their appearance, arriving singly at short intervals. The housekeeper was dismissed to her own room, and the four men, having seated themselves at the table, began to mix their grog according to their taste. "'I suppose you've heard the news, Mr. Bones,' said Jeffreys. "'About your late master and his wife, eh?' asked Old Death. "'Just so. They're in a pretty pickle, aren't they?' exclaimed Jeffreys with a chuckle. "'We little thought last night, when we was a-talking over the whole business and dividing the swag, that the corpse would so soon turn up again. But I say,' he added, now breaking out into a horrible laugh and turning towards Tim the Snammer and Josh Pedler, "'It was rather curious, though, that I should have had a hand in burying that there feller which you made away with.' And still more curious, replied Tim, that we should have done for a stranger, while the master of the house himself escaped altogether. But tis no use talking of that there now. I wish it hadn't happened. It was, however, done in a hurry. Never mind the little windpipe slitting affair, said Josh Pedler impatiently. We got the swag. Old Death here smashed the screens. Footnote. Changed the notes. In footnote and that's all we ought to think of. Twelve hundred between us wasn't such a bad night's work, although it did lead us to do a thing we never did afore. And now my late master is certain sure to be scragged for it, exclaimed Jeffreys, for no one could believe such a tale as he must tell in his defense. Well, I'm not sorry for him. He is a harsh, reserved, sullen kind of a chap. But there's one thing I'm precious sorry for. "'What's that?' demanded Old Death. "'Why, he promised me fifty pounds to be paid this evening at seven o'clock,' answered Jeffreys, "'on condition that I'd leave his service at an instant's notice. "'And the blunt isn't, of course, forthcoming.' "'Never mind that. "'Don't make yourself uneasy, my boy,' said Old Death, with a significant chuckle. "'You've got plenty of money for the present, "'and the business which we've met to talk about "'will put ever so much more into your pocket.' "'Well, let's to business, then,' exclaimed Jeffreys. "'The fact is, I shan't go out to service no more, "'for, since I'm regularly in with you fellers now, I shall stick to you. "'And I can always find you employment, lads,' observed Old Death. "'Come, help yourselves. "'We shall get on so much more comfortable when we're a little warmed with good liquor.' "'The cunning old file!' exclaimed Tim the Snammer, laughing and winking at his comrade Josh Pedler. He wants to make us half lushy, so as to get us to undertake anything, no matter how desperate, on his own terms. "'Pon my word, Tim,' said Old Death, affecting a pleasant chuckle, which, however, sounded like the echo of a deep-toned voice in a cavern, "'you are too hard upon me. I don't mean any such thing. I'll treat you liberally, whatever you do for me.' "'And so you ought, old boy,' returned Tim Splint, "'for you know how I suffered by you.' and how cursed shabby you behaved towards me. "'We agreed yesterday to let bygones be bygones,' said Benjamin Bone somewhat sternly. "'Do you mean to keep to that arrangement, or am I to consider that you still bear me a grudge?' "'No, no,' cried Tim. "'What I said was only in fun. "'So tip us your hand, old boy. "'There. "'Now we'll each brew another glass, "'and you shall explain your business while we blow a cloud.' The fresh supplies of grog were duly mixed. Jeffreys, Josh Pedler, and Tim Splint lighted their pipes, and Old Death addressed them in the following manner. There is a man in London who has done me a most serious injury, an injury so great that I can never cease to feel its consequences as long as I live. In a word, continued Old Death, his features becoming absolutely hideous with the workings of evil passions, he discovered my secret stores. He destroyed all the treasures, the valuables, and the possessions which I had been years and years in accumulating. "'Destroyed them?' cried Tim Splint. "'Stole them, you mean. No. Destroyed them. Wantonly destroyed them. Destroyed them all.' "'All!' yelled forth Old Death, his usually sepulchral voice becoming thrilling and penetrating with hyena-like rage. "'The miscreant!' The fiend! All, all was destroyed! Thousands and thousands of pounds worth of valuables wantonly, 
willfully, methodically destroyed. I did not see the work of ruin, but I know that it must have taken place, because the man of whom I speak is what the world calls honorable. Perdition takes such honor. But of what use was all that property to you since you didn't convert it into money, demanded Josh Pedler. Of what use, cried old Death, again speaking in that yelling tone which manifested violent emotions. Is there no use in keeping precious things to look at, to gloat upon, to calculate their value? To be sure, to be sure there is, he continued with a horrible chuckle. But of that no matter. It is sufficient for you to know that I was deprived in one hour, in one minute, as you may say, of that property which had been accumulating for years, and the house, too, which was mine so long, which I had purchased on account of its conveniences, even those premises this man of whom I speak made me sell him. But I swore to have vengeance on him. I told him so when we parted, and I will keep my word. Who is this person that you speak of? asked Tim the Snammer. The Earl of Ellingham, was the reply. He is a great and powerful nobleman, I suppose, observed Tim. It will be difficult and dangerous to do him any harm. What's a nobleman more than another? cried John Jeffreys. I, for one, will undertake anything that our friend Mr. Bones may propose. And so will I, if we're well paid, added Josh Pedler. But there's one thing I must mention while I think on it. Don't none of you ever speak about that affair down in Torrings, you know. The cutthroat business, I mean, before my blowin' Matilda. I like to have a little comfort at home, and a woman's tongue is the devil when it's set a-wagging in the blowing-up way. We'll mind our P's and Q's before Tilda, said Tim the Snammer. It isn't likely that any of us would be such fools as to talk of that business to women, or to others besides ourselves. But let Mr. Bones continue his explanations. I have told you enough, resumed old Death, to convince you that this Earl of Ellingham deserves no mercy at my hands, and if I say that I will give each of you a hundred pounds, yes, a hundred pounds each, to do my bidding in all things calculated to accomplish my vengeance on that man, if I make you this promise, I suppose you will not refuse to enlist yourselves in my employ. But mark you, he added hastily, and with a sinister knitting of the brows, before you give me your answer, bear in mind that my vengeance is to be terrible, terrible in the extreme. You mean to have the Earl murdered, I suppose, said John Jeffreys. Murdered? Killed? No, no, exclaimed Old Death, that would be a vengeance little calculated to appease me. He must live to know, to feel, that I am avenged, added the malignant old villain. He must experience such outrages, such insults, such ignominy, that he may writhe and smart under them like a worm under the teeth of the harrow. He must be made aware whence the blow comes, by whose order it is dealt, and wherefore it is leveled against him. Will you then for one week devote yourselves to my service? If you agree, I will at once give you an earnest of the sums promised as your recompense. If you refuse, there is an end of the matter, and I must look out elsewhere. But you haven't told us what we are to do to earn our reward, said Josh Pedler. There is no murder in the case, observed Old Death emphatically. Then I, for one, consent without another minute's hesitation, exclaimed Josh Pedler. And me too, said Tim the Snammer. And I'm sure I'm not going to hang back, cried John Jeffreys. Good, continued Benjamin Bones. Though you've all got plenty of money in your pockets, there's no harm in having more. I will give you each thirty pounds on account of the business I have now in hand, he added, taking his greasy pocket-book from the bosom of his old grey coat. The specified amount was handed over to each of the three villains who received the bank-notes with immense satisfaction. Three or four more things like Torings and this, observed Tim the Snammer, and we shall be able to set up in business as gentlemen for the rest of our lives. Now listen to me, resumed old Death, his countenance expressing an infernal triumph, as if his vengeance were already more than half consummated. In the first place I must tell you that I'm going to move tomorrow morning up to Bunce's house in Earl Street, Seven Dials, and tomorrow night must you perform the first duty I require of you. And what's that? demanded Josh Pedler. You know that a few weeks ago a certain person named Thomas Rainford was hanged at Horsemonger Lane Jail, proceeded Old Death, glancing rapidly around from beneath his shaggy, 
overhanging brows. The very prince of highwaymen. A glorious fellow. A man I could have loved, exclaimed Josh Pedler, in a tone the enthusiasm of which denoted his heart's sincerity. Well, well, said old Death impatiently. But he's put out of the way. Dead. And gone. And it's no use regretting him, I suppose, he added, that if you saw Tom Rain's body here, you wouldn't mind spitting in the face of the corpse or treating it with any other kind of indignity if you was well rewarded for your pains. Why? My respect for the man while he was living wouldn't make me such a fool to my own interest as to refuse to do what you say now that he's dead, answered Josh Bedler. Besides, a dead body's a lump of clay or earth or whatever else you may choose to call it. At all events, it can't feel anything that's done to it. But what in the world has made you touch on such a queer subject? Because it is with Tom Rain's body that you will have to come in contact tomorrow night, responded Old Death, in a low, sepulchral voice and now fixing his eyes, as it were, on all three at the same time. And those three men started with astonishment at this extraordinary and incomprehensible announcement. Yes, proceeded Benjamin Bones, it is just as I tell you, for the late Thomas Rainford was the elder brother of the Earl of Ellingham and was legitimately born. This declaration excited fresh surprise on the part of the three men to whom it was addressed. And therefore, continued the aged miscreant, his countenance contracting with savage wrinkles, it must be, by the desecration of the corpse of Tom Rain, that the Earl will be alike exposed to the whole world and goaded to desperation by the insult offered to the remains of his brother. Now do you begin to understand me? No? Well, then, I will explain myself more fully. It is known that the Earl demanded of the Sheriff the corpse of the highwayman that his request was complied with, and that the body was interred privately in consecrated ground. I set people to make inquiries, and it was only this morning, this very morning, I learnt that a coffin with the name of Thomas Rainford on the plate was buried in St. Luke's churchyard. This intelligence my friend Tidmarsh gleaned from the sexton of that church. Tomorrow night, added Old Death, it is for you three to have up that coffin and convey it to the Bunce's house in Earl Street, Seven Dials. Do you want us to turn resurrectionist? demanded Josh Pedler in unfeigned surprise. I wish you to do what I direct, and what I am going to pay you well for, answered Benjamin Bones. If you refuse, give me back my money and I'll find others who will be less particular. Oh, I don't want to fly from the bargain, said Josh. Only you'll allow me the right of being astonished if I choose, or, rather, if I can't help it. As for the resurrection part of the business, I'd have up all the coffins in St. Luke's churchyard on the same terms. I thought you were not the man to retreat from a bargain, observed Old Death. Well, when you have brought the coffin to Earl Street, we'll take out the body, put a rope round its neck and a placard on its breast and that placard shall tell all the world that it is the corpse of Thomas Rainford, the famous highwayman who was executed at Horsemonger Lane Jail, and who was the rightful Earl of Ellingham. This being done, it will be for you to convey the body to Pall Mall just before daybreak, and place it on the steps of the hated nobleman's mansion. There will be danger and difficulty in performing that part of the task, said Tim the Snammer. Not at all, exclaimed Old Death. A light spring-cart will speedily convey the burden to Pall Mall, and it will be but the work of a few moments to achieve the rest. Besides, at that hour in the morning there is no one abroad. All this can be managed easy enough, observed Jeffreys. I don't flinch for one. Is that everything we shall have to do? No. No, replied Ben Bones, with a grim smile. I can't quite give three hundred pounds for one night's work. But since we are on the subject, I may as well explain to you what else I require in order to render my vengeance complete. The three men replenished their glasses and their pipes, and old death then proceeded to address them in the following manner. From certain information which I have received, I am confident that the Earl of Ellingham experiences a great friendship towards Esther de Medina, who was, I am pretty certain, Rainford's mistress. It must be remembered that Benjamin Bones knew nothing of those incidents which have revealed to the reader the existence of Tamer, her beautiful sister's counterpart. This Esther de Medina is now in London, having been absent for a short time with her father. 
Another important point is that the newspaper some weeks ago announced the intended marriage of the Earl of Ellingham and Lady Hatfield. We are therefore aware of these two facts, that the Earl is attached to Esther de Medina as a friend, and to Lady Hatfield as her future husband. It may also be proper to remind the reader that his old death knew nothing more of the position in which the nobleman and Georgiana stood with regard to each other than what he had gleaned from the fashionable intelligence in the public prints, so he was completely ignorant of all the circumstances which had tended to break off the alliance thus announced. Now, resumed the malignant old fiend, his eyes glistening with demoniac spite as he glanced rapidly from Josh Pedler to Tim the Snammer, and from Tim the Snammer to John Jeffreys, now it is my intention to wound the heart of that hated earl, that detested nobleman, through the medium of his best affections. Yes, by torturing those ladies I shall torture him. By subjecting them to frightful inflictions I shall punish him with awful severity. For tomorrow night, my good friends, your occupation is chalked out. For the night after the task will be to inveigle Esther de Medina, to the house in Earl Street, and on the night after that Lady Hatfield must also be enticed thither. How these points are to be accomplished I will tell you when the time for action comes. And what do you mean to do with the two ladies when you get them there? demanded Tim the Snammer. What will I do to them? repeated Old Death, his features animated with a malignity so horrible, so reptile-like, that he was at the moment a spectacle hideous to contemplate. What will I do to them? I will tell them all I have endured, all I have suffered at the hands of the hated, the abhorred Earl of Ellingham, and you three will be at hand to hold them tight, to bind them, to gag them, so that I, with a wire-heated red, may— What? demanded Jeffreys impatiently. Blind them, returned Old Death, sinking his voice to a whisper which sounded hollow and sepulchral. The three villains— villains as they were, started at the frightful intention thus announced to them. Yes, I will put out their beautiful eyes, said Benjamin Bones, clenching his fists with feverish excitement. Then I will leave them bound hand and foot in the house, and will send a letter to the Earl to tell him where he may seek for them. Will not such vengeance as this be sweet? Did you ever hear of a vengeance more complete? The Earl I leave unhurt, save in mind and there he will be cruelly lacerated. But he must have his eyes, to see that those whom he loves are blind. He must be spared his powers of vision, that he may read in the newspapers the account of those indignities which will have been shown to the corpse of his elder brother. And as he feasted his imagination with these projects of diabolical vengeance, the horrible old man chuckled in his usual style as if it were a corpse that so chuckled. The three miscreants whom he had taken into his service expressed their readiness to assist him in all his nefarious plans, for the reward he had promised them was great, and the earnest they had received was most exhilarating to their evil spirits. The infernal project having been fully discussed, and it having been agreed that Tidmarsh should proceed with one of the three villains in the morning to St. Luke's churchyard, to point out the precise spot where the coffin bearing the name of Thomas Rainford had been interred, all preliminaries, in a word, having been thus settled, the old housekeeper was summoned to place the supper upon the table. The meal was done hearty justice to, and when the things were cleared away, old Death, who was anxious to conciliate his friends as much as possible, by a show of liberality, commissioned John Jeffreys to compound a mighty jorum of punch, the ingredients for which were bountifully supplied from the cupboard, the washstand basin serving as a bowl. And now the four villains— Four villains as hardened and as ready for mischief as any to be found in all London, dismissed from their minds every matter of business, and set to work to do justice to the punch. Come, who'll sing us a song? exclaimed Tim the Snammer. Don't let us have any singing, my dear friend, said Old Death. We shall alarm the neighbours, and it's better to be as quiet as possible. Well, we must do something to amuse ourselves, insisted Timothy Splint. If we get talking, it will only be on things of which we all have quite enough in our minds, and so I vote that someone tells us a story. I'm very fond of stories, particularly when they're true. I'll tell you a true story, if you like, said Jeffreys, for I don't mind about smoking any more. In fact, I'll give you my own history, and a precious curious one it is, too. Do, said Josh Pedler, 
but mind and don't introduce no lies into it, that's all. Every word is as true as gospel, observed Jeffreys. The glasses were replenished. Old Death snuffed the candles with his withered, trembling hand, and Jeffreys then commenced his narrative, which, as in former instances, we have modelled into a readable shape. End of section 88 Recording by Philip Gould Section 89 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter 85, The History of a Livery Servant my parents were very poor but very honest my father was a light porter in a warehouse earning fifteen shillings a week and my mother took in washing to obtain a few shillings more we lived in a court leading out of high holborn and occupied one room which was very decently furnished for people in my parents condition of life the things moreover being all their own my father had a good suit of clothes and my mother a nice gown bonnet and shawl for sundays and holidays and they also took care to keep me neat and decent in my dress neither of them ever went to the public house except just to fetch the beer for dinner and supper and they were always regular in their attendance at church in addition to all these proofs of good conduct and respectability they put by two or three shillings a week as a provision against a rainy day and you may be sure that to be able to do this they lived very economically indeed in fact a more industrious couple did not exist than my father and mother and you will admit that they deserved to succeed in the world this much i have heard from people who knew them for they died when i was too young to be able to understand their ways or judge of their merits it seems that my mother was a very pretty young woman she had been a servant in the family of the merchant in whose warehouse my father was and an attachment springing up between them they married the merchant whose name was shaw had a son a dissipated young man addicted to gaming and bad company and consequently a source of great uneasiness to his parents who were highly respectable people during the time that my mother was in service at the merchants frederick shaw was on the continent his father having sent him to a commercial establishment at rotterdam in the hope that he would amend his ways when under the care of comparative strangers but this hope it appears was completely disappointed and the young man was after all sent back to his father's house as irreclaimable at this time my parents had been married three years and i was two years old my mother was in the habit of taking my father's dinner to him at the warehouse whenever his duties prevented him from running home to get it and on one of these occasions frederick shaw saw her as she was going out of the establishment he followed her made insulting proposals and behaved most grossly she had me with her and this circumstance rendered his conduct the more abominable if anything was wanting to aggravate it indeed his persecution was carried to such an excess that she was obliged to take refuge in a shop where she went into hysterics through fright and indignation shaw sneaked away the moment he found that the master of the shop was disposed to take my mother's part against him and when she was a little recovered she was sent home in a hackney coach on the return of my father in the evening she told him 
all that had occurred and it seems that she had scarcely made an end of her narrative when frederick shaw entered the room he declared that he had come to express his sincere penitence for what he had done and to implore that his father might not be made acquainted with his behaviour he seemed so earnest and so excessively sorry for his infamous conduct that my parents consented to look over it he thanked them over and over again and took his departure my father however desired his wife never to come to the warehouse to him any more as he was unwilling to expose her to even the chance of a repetition of the insult a few weeks after this occurrence frederick shaw one evening when under the influence of liquor called at our lodgings my father being absent and renewed his outrageous conduct towards my mother an alarm was created in the dwelling a constable was sent for and the young gentleman was taken off to the watch-house of course the matter was now too serious to be hushed up and the elder mr shaw necessarily learnt all the particulars his son was fined and held to bail to keep the peace towards mrs jeffreys and my father obtained another situation for though the old merchant knew that his son was alone to blame yet my father thought that he could not prudently remain in a place where he must daily meet a person who he felt convinced was now his sworn enemy and such indeed did frederick shaw prove to be for by misrepresentations and heaven only knows what other underhand means he so successfully avenged himself that my poor father soon lost his new situation and was totally unable to find another the most infamous reports were circulated concerning him and he took the cruel treatment he had received so much to heart that his spirit was completely broken he fell ill and died in a few weeks poverty and despair thus seized upon my mother at the same moment she saw all her happiness suddenly blasted by the agency of a reckless villain and to add to her afflictions the only friend who showed any compassion for her or who came forward to assist her in the midst of her wretchedness namely the old merchant was suddenly snatched away by the hand of death ten days after the earth had closed over my father's remains the poor woman was unable to bear up against her sorrows she languished for a few months and then departed this life leaving me a friendless and unprotected orphan at the tender age of three years you may guess what then became of me i was taken to the workhouse i have sketched these circumstances just to show you how unfortunate i was in my earliest infancy my parents would have lived to thrive and prosper had it not been for the miscreant frederick shaw and under their protection i should have been happy however it was destined that my father and mother should be cut off thus early and their cruel fate threw me as a pauper child upon the parish at the workhouse i remained until i was thirteen and it was from an elderly couple whom distress brought to the same place and who had known my parents well that i learnt all the particulars which i have related to you well at the age of thirteen i was transferred to the care of a surgeon and a coucher who took me into his house to clean the boots and shoes run on errands and beat up drugs in the mortar finding me active and as he said a good-looking lad for i was not then seared with the smallpox as i am now he put me into the regular livery of a doctor's boy after i had been with him a few months and i was then entrusted with the delivery of the medicine my master was an old man and his wife was a bustling active elderly lady in whom implicit confidence might be placed as long as she was well paid for her services and her secrecy 
you will understand what i mean very shortly in fact one day i noticed a great deal of whispering between the doctor his wife and the housekeeper and their looks were mysterious and important certain preparations too commenced which showed me that a visitor was expected for i was a shrewd and observing boy for my age i was ordered to clean the windows in the spare bedroom and the well-furnished little parlour communicating with it and while i was thus occupied the housekeeper put the two apartments into the nicest possible order i asked her if any one was coming to stay at the house and was desired to mind my own business i accordingly held my tongue but my curiosity was only the more excited in consequence of the answer i received and the mystery in which the motive of the preparations in progress was involved at an earlier hour than usual i was ordered to retire to my own room but as it commanded a view of the street it was brook street holborn i sat up watching at my window for i felt sure that i had not been dismissed to my attic without some good reason nor was i mistaken at about half-past ten a hackney coach drove up to the door two trunks were carried into the house and a lady muffled in a cloak was assisted to descend from the vehicle by the doctor and his wife who seemed to treat her with the greatest respect i was able to notice all that passed because the moon was bright and i was looking out of the open window the lady accompanied the doctor and his wife indoors and the coach drove away next morning i saw the housekeeper take up a breakfast tray to those rooms which i had now no doubt were occupied by the lady who had arrived the night before but i was cautious not to appear even to notice that anything unusual was going on much less to ask questions for i remembered the rebuff i had already received in this latter respect the cook and housemaid were as mysteriously reserved as the housekeeper herself and i could not for the life of me make out what it all meant to be brief a month passed away and though i never saw the tenant of the spare rooms all the while yet i knew that a tenant those rooms had for the meals were regularly taken up the doctor looked in there two or three times a day and his wife passed hours together there at length the housemaid who was a pretty wicked-looking girl of about nineteen undertook to initiate me into this secret which so much puzzled me and taking advantage of a sunday evening when she and i were alone together the other servants having gone out she explained how some young lady who was not married was about to become a mother and how the spare rooms were always kept for lodgers of that kind have you seen her i asked no she replied nor am i likely to see her i have been four years in this house and during that time there have been eight or ten ladies here in the same way but i never caught a glimpse of the face of any one of them they pay or their friends pay for them a good round sum to master for the accommodation and that is the manner in which he has made so much money for you can see that his regular practice is not very great but you must not tell anybody that i have been talking to you in this style john or else i shall lose my place i promised her not to betray her how old are you john she asked going on for fourteen i said you are a pretty boy she continued would you like to give me a kiss you would think me very rude i answered no i shouldn't try but i should feel so ashamed i said then you are a fool john exclaimed the pretty housemaid and she got into a pet which lasted all the rest of the evening i lay awake a long time that night thinking of what i had heard concerning the lady in the private apartments and i can't say how it was but i felt an extraordinary longing to catch a glimpse of her the more i reflected on this wish the stronger it grew and at last i determined to gratify it somehow or another 
having come to this resolution i fell asleep next morning the two penny postman at eight o'clock brought a letter directed to my master but in the corner were two or three initials which i could not quite make out i took it into the parlour where the doctor was seated alone at the time and when he had glanced at the address he said oh it is to go upstairs give it to the housekeeper and he went on reading his newspaper here was an opportunity which presented itself almost as soon as my desire to see the tenant of the spare rooms had been formed and without any hesitation i hurried upstairs i knocked at the door of the parlour communicating with the bedchamber and a sweet voice said come in i accordingly entered the room and beheld a beautiful creature of about seventeen or eighteen dressed in a morning wrapper all open at the bosom and reclining in an arm-chair she uttered an exclamation of surprise when she saw me and drew the wrapper completely over her breast it was evident that she had expected to see either the housekeeper or my mistress i handed her the note stammered out something about master having told me to bring it up and then retired awkward and embarrassed enough a few minutes afterwards the bell of the spare rooms was rung rather violently and the housekeeper went up she shortly came down again and went into the parlour to which i was presently summoned the doctor and his wife were seated at the breakfast-table looking as gloomy and solemn as possible and the housekeeper was standing in the middle of the room i suspected that a storm was brewing john said the doctor what induced you to take such a liberty as to enter the apartments of a lady who is lodging in my house please sir i answered as boldly as possible you told me to take up the letter and i did so the doctor his wife and the housekeeper looked at each other by turns and then they all three looked very hard at me well said the doctor i suppose it was a misunderstanding on the boy's part for i did not blush nor seem at all confused while they were all staring at me but you must not tell any one that you saw the lady upstairs john exclaimed my mistress i don't know a soul who would care about knowing such a simple thing ma'am i replied pretending to be very innocent indeed i was then told to withdraw and thus passed off this little affair throughout that day i saw the pretty housemaid showing great anxiety to speak to me alone but circumstances so occurred that we had not an opportunity of exchanging a word in private together at half-past nine i went to bed as usual an hour before the other servants and i soon fell asleep but i was awoke by some one shaking me gently and i was also startled by seeing a light in the room in another moment my fears subsided for my visitor was the pretty servant girl in her night gear she sat down on the edge of the bed and asked me what i was called into the parlour for in the morning i told her all that had occurred you are a dear boy she said not to have confessed that i had put you up to anything for that was what i was afraid of and she gave me two or three hearty kisses then she asked me a great number of questions about the lady i had seen what she was like how old the colour of her hair and eyes and all sorts of queries of that kind i replied as well as i could and she seemed vastly to enjoy the idea of my cool impudence in taking up the letter just for the sake of getting a peep at the lady in fact she was so much pleased with me that she kept on kissing me and all this ended just as you might suppose for the pretty housemaid shared my bed during the remainder of the night this occurrence was most unfortunate to us both for we overslept ourselves and the housekeeper doubtless having vainly searched for us downstairs came up to look after us we were discovered fast asleep in each other's arms and a terrible scene ensued the housekeeper alarmed the doctor and his wife with her cries for i suppose the old lady was quite scandalized 
though she herself had often chucked me under the chin in a tender manner the result was that the pretty housemaid was packed off without delay and i was stripped of my livery compelled to put on my workhouse clothes again and sent back to the parish officers at the very moment when i was conveyed into the presence of the overseers by the doctor a middle-aged lady magnificently dressed was returning to her carriage which waited at the door she immediately recognized the doctor as an acquaintance and he addressed her by the name of mrs beaumont the exchange of a few remarks led the lady to observe that she had applied to the parish officers for a well-conducted genteel-looking lad to take the place of a page in her household and as she spoke she eyed me very attentively the doctor informed her that i had been in his service and was a good boy in all respects save one and he explained to her the indiscretion which had compelled him to part with me adding the lad was no doubt won over by the young woman herself but as my professional success depends on the reputation of my house i could not overlook this occurrence the lady declared that she entertained great compassion for me and said what a pity it was that such a nice boy should be thrown back on the parish in a word the business ended by her agreeing to take me on trial and before the doctor left me he whispered in my ear you see john that i have not ruined your character as i might have done and therefore you must be a good lad and never mention to any one that you saw the lady who is now lodging at my house he then took his departure and mrs beaumont having arranged with the overseers relative to receiving me into her service desired that i might be sent to her abode in the evening the instructions were obeyed and i entered my new place the first appearances of which pleased me much mrs beaumont was a widow lady of about six-and-forty and was still a very handsome woman considering her age her house was in russell square and she lived in an elegant style keeping a butler a footman and three female domestics she had a miss stacy residing with her as a companion and this lady was about five or six-and-twenty somewhat stout and rather good-looking the moment i entered my new place i was supplied with a page's livery and was informed that i was to consider myself at the orders of the butler i soon found that i had got into very comfortable quarters for the best of provisions were consumed in the kitchen as well as in the parlour and the butler who was fond of a glass of good liquor himself often treated me to some likewise mrs beaumont saw a great deal of company and there were dinner parties or evening parties at least three or four times every week i had not been many days in this place before i began to notice that both mrs beaumont and miss stacy treated me with much the same kind of innocent familiarity which the housekeeper at the doctor's had shown towards me they would pat me on the cheek or chuck me under the chin and tell me i was a nice boy but this they never did before each other only when i happened to be alone with either one of them indeed when they were together and i entered the room to answer the bell or for any other purpose connected with my duties they would both appear as indifferent towards me as if they had never shown any other feeling in my behalf of the two i liked miss stacy much the best because she was younger and i felt a strange excitement come over me whenever she began to toy about with me in the way i have described one day when i entered the drawing-room where i found her alone at the time she said to me john you are a very nice boy and here is half a guinea for you to buy what you like only don't let any one know that i gave you the money certainly not miss i replied and now john she continued i want you to answer me a question which i am going to put to you will you tell me the truth i of course declared that i would then tell me she said patting my face and looking full at me with her large blue eyes does mrs beaumont ever play about with you as i do oh never miss i answered immediately and without undergoing the least change of countenance 
you are a good boy john she said and pulling me towards her covered me with kisses a double knock at the front door interrupted her amusement which as you may suppose i took in very good part and she hurried me out of the room enjoining me not to tell any one that she played about with me the next day mrs beaumont was rather indisposed and kept her own chamber until the evening when she descended to the drawing-room miss stacy had gone out to a party at a married sister's and the footman being absent likewise it devolved upon me to take up the tea-tray well john said my mistress are you comfortable in your present place quite thank you ma'am i replied you like it better than the doctor's she continued smoothing down my hair and then passing her hand over my face oh a great deal ma'am but do you not miss the pretty servant-girl john she asked with a sly look and a half smile why what a naughty boy you must be and at such an age too it was all the young woman's fault ma'am i said and i hope you do not think any the worse of me for it if i had i should not have taken you into my service john she answered and to show you that i am really attached to you and consider you to be a very good boy here is a sovereign for you it is not on account of your wages mind but a little gift you must not however tell anybody that i gave it to you or else you will make the other servants jealous i'll be sure not to tell ma'am i said and i thank you very much and now john continued mrs beaumont i have one question to put to you and you must tell me the truth does miss stacy ever speak kindly to you i mean does she ever do anything to show you that she likes you better than the other servants no ma'am i replied on the contrary i fancy she sometimes speaks sharp to me oh indeed said mrs beaumont and she then subjected me to the same kissing process that i had undergone on the part of miss stacy only i did not like it quite so well the old lady hugged me very tight and seemed as if she wanted to say something but did not exactly like to do so at last she spoke out plainly enough though in a whispering tone john she said i just now gave you a sovereign because you are a good boy and i will give you another if you will do what i ask you and not tell any one about it should you like to have another sovereign very much indeed ma'am i answered well then continued mrs beaumont you must come to my room to-night when the house is all quiet because i want to speak to you very particularly indeed but i promised the servants ma'am to sit up to let miss stacy in i answered so much the better observed mrs beaumont miss stacy has promised to be back by twelve at latest and as soon as you have let her in you can go up to your own room and then a few minutes afterwards come down to mine i promised to do exactly as i was desired and having received a few more kisses and pawings about was suffered to return to the kitchen the footman came back at eleven and as mrs beaumont had already retired to her chamber all the servants except myself went off to theirs i then remained alone in the kitchen thinking of what had occurred between my mistress and myself and not half liking the idea of sleeping with her for i knew very well what her object was in asking me to go to her room i wished it had been miss stacy who had made such an appointment with me for young as i was i was greatly smitten with that lady and i thought she had never looked so well as when i saw her that evening dressed for the party to which she had gone she had on a very low gown and her neck was so beautifully white and her naked arms seemed so plump that i was really quite in love with her it gave me great pleasure to think that i had been chosen to sit up for her and i longed for her return the clock struck twelve and a few minutes afterwards a vehicle stopped at the door i knew it must be miss stacy who had come back and i did not wait for the knock and ring but hurried to the hall to admit her she seemed pleased when she saw who it was that opened the door for her and i observed that her countenance was rather flushed as if she had been drinking an extra glass of champagne of which i knew she was very fond the moment i had closed and bolted the door she asked me in a low whisper whether any of the other servants were up i answered in the negative 
does your mistress know that you are sitting up for me she next inquired no miss i unhesitatingly said she began to caress me and i found that she smelt rather strong of wine but she looked so nice that i did not care about that and i was so excited that i kissed her in return light me upstairs john she at length said and let us go as gently as possible so as not to make any noise on account of mrs beaumont who is unwell i led the way upstairs my heart beating violently for i more than half suspected that i should not keep my appointment with my mistress that night nor was i mistaken for on reaching the door of miss stacy's chamber she took my hand drew me towards her and said in a low hurried whisper come down to my room in about a quarter of an hour i wish to speak to you very particularly indeed i promised to do so and hurried up to my own chamber miss stacy having previously lighted her candle and said good night john in a tolerably loud voice but making a sign to convince me that it was only a precaution on her part when i reached my room i sat down on the bed to think how i should act my inclination prompted me to keep the appointment with miss stacy my fears urged me to keep the one given me by mrs beaumont i cared nothing about the sovereign promised me by my mistress now that i had received such an invitation from her pretty companion and i thought that it would be very easy to excuse myself to mrs beaumont should she question me next day by saying that i fancied her to be only joking or perhaps trying me so at last i resolved to follow my inclinations and disregard my fears and i acted in pursuance of this determination i accordingly repaired to miss stacy's room and was completely happy we had been an hour together when a knock at the door alarmed us who could it be what could it mean we remained silent as the dead the knock was repeated and was immediately followed by mrs beaumont's voice saying miss stacy dear miss stacy good god what can she want whispered miss stacy to me she is perhaps unwell and will come into the room to speak to me john my dear boy you must get under the bed and keep as quiet as a mouse this was done in a moment and miss stacy bundled my clothes under the bed after me she then opened the door and sure enough my mistress entered the room saying i am sorry to disturb you my dear but i am so unwell i cannot sleep i have got such nervous feelings that i am really afraid to be alone had i not better call up one of the servants and send for the doctor my dear madam asked miss stacy her voice trembling i could well conjecture why no thank you dear answered the lady if you have no objection i will pass the remainder of the night with you oh with pleasure ma'am exclaimed miss stacy i will accompany you to your room directly we may as well remain here replied mrs beaumont and it struck me that there was something strange in the way that she spoke miss stacy urged that it was very injurious for persons in delicate health to change their beds but mrs beaumont declared it to be a mere prejudice miss stacy invented some other frivolous excuse and i suppose that this confirmed mrs beaumont's suspicions for she immediately exclaimed really one would suppose that you wish to get rid of me miss stacy to speak candidly my dear madam was the reply i can't bear sleeping with another person indeed said mrs beaumont heyday what shoes have we here why surely these cannot be yours my dear i have noticed that the more spiteful ladies are together the more they dear each other it must be some oversight on the part of one of the servants said miss stacy in a faint tone it's very strange cried mrs beaumont and i heard her stoop down and take up the unfortunate shoes oh how i did shiver and tremble and how sincerely i wished both the amorous ladies at the devil at that moment but matters grew speedily much worse for in stooping down to pick up the shoes mrs beaumont had spied my trousers and these she fished up in another moment miss stacy shrieked mrs beaumont raised the drapery hanging round the bed to the floor and behold by the light of the candle which had been left burning in the room she discovered unfortunate me i cannot tell you what a scene ensued mrs beaumont raved like a mad woman and miss stacy protested her innocence the house was alarmed the other servants came down to the door and mrs beaumont's reproaches and upbraidings levelled against miss stacy and myself made everything known to them 
i scarcely know how i had pluck enough to play the part which i did play but it is notwithstanding a fact that i was resolved to screen miss stacy and throw all the scandal on mrs beaumont i accordingly begged to be allowed to explain and when i could obtain a hearing i swore that mrs beaumont had given me a sovereign and promised me another to sleep with her that i had mistaken the room and that the moment i had seen miss stacy enter and perceive my error i had managed to creep under the bed unnoticed by her mrs beaumont went into strong hysterics at this accusation and was conveyed away to her own apartment by the female servants while i hurried off to my own room you may suppose that i scarcely slept a wink all the remainder of the night i knew that i had lost both my place and my character but i felt satisfied in having done all i could to screen poor miss stacy though it did not strike me at the time that my version of the business could not possibly be taken as a very probable story next morning the butler came up to me very early and in a long humbugging speech assured me that out of good feeling towards me mrs beaumont had consented to keep me in her service and look over the affair if i would confess the truth i however persisted in my original statement and displayed the sovereign that mrs beaumont had given me the butler went away telling me not to leave my room until he came back half an hour passed before he returned and again he tried to argue me into his views but i was obstinate and the interview ended by his desiring me to pack up my things and leave the house directly this i very willingly agreed to and in a few minutes my preparations were complete where are you going to youngster asked the butler when he had paid me the amount of wages due i don't know was my reply well he said i should advise you to take a room at the family washerwoman's she has got one to let i know and if you hold your tongue about what has occurred in this house i will try and get you another place i readily gave the required promise and also followed the advice relative to the lodging in which i was installed in another half hour end of section eighty nine section ninety of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section ninety in the evening the butler came to me and gave me the addresses of several families in whose service pages were wanted you will have to apply to the butlers at those houses he said and therefore you can refer them to me i will endeavour to make it all right for you as i should be sorry to see a promising young lad ruined for want of a character i thanked him very much pretending to see nothing but pure friendship in his conduct although i was quite enough experienced in the ways of the world to understand that mrs beaumont herself had instigated this lenient treatment as a means of sealing my lips i ventured to ask him about miss stacy and he at once told me that she had left the house at a very early hour in the morning i longed to inquire if he knew where she was gone but dared not on the following day i called at the various addresses which the butler had given me and was not considered suitable at any at one i was thought too young at another too old here i was too short there i was too tall in fact the objections were trivial but fatal i was returning to my lodging along great russell street bloomsbury when i saw in a shop window a notice that a livery boy was wanted and that applications were to be made within i entered the shop and received the address of a house in the same street there i went and was shown into a small parlour 
where i was kept waiting for nearly a quarter of an hour at last a gentleman and lady an elderly couple entered the room and i was immediately subjected to no end of questions all of which i answered in the most satisfactory manner because i did not hesitate to say yes when an affirmation was required and no when a negative was necessary at last the gentleman said to the lady well my love what do you think what do you think my dear asked the lady i think my dear began the gentleman so do i mr turner exclaimed the lady without waiting to hear what her husband did think it however appeared that they perfectly well understood each other for the lady turning towards me said we will give you a trial if the butler at your last place speaks as well of you as you assure us he will but you will have to be very active here for i must tell you that this is a boarding-house a boarding-house of the highest respectability interrupted the gentleman looking very solemn indeed as if he was afraid that i was going to say i didn't believe him and there are many ladies and gentlemen to wait upon continued mrs turner but we shall see i then withdrew mr turner went about my character in the evening and found everything satisfactory and next day i entered my new place wondering what adventures would befall me here this boarding-house proved to be the hardest place i ever was in i had to get up at five in the morning to clean six pairs of boots and ten pairs of ladies shoes if they did not shine well i was blown up on all sides and if i did make them shine well mrs turner blew me up for wasting the blacking then i had to beeswax heaven knows how many chairs and tables and to clean the windows from top to bottom at least twice a week in the middle of my work i was constantly interrupted by knocks at the door or errands to run upon then at meal-time something was always wanting something had always been forgotten the cleaning of knives and plated forks and spoons would have alone been a good four hours work for a strong man if i did them properly and devoted time to them i was scolded for being slow and lazy and if i knocked them off in a hurry they were sure to be found fault with sometimes the bells of half a dozen rooms would ring in the morning when the boarders were getting up all at the same instant and if i was long in taking up any particular gentleman's hot water to shave or any lady's shoes i was certain to hear of it when mrs turner came down into the kitchen in fact it was a hard life and an unthankful office for when i did my best i could not give satisfaction and yet the cook and housemaid the only servants kept besides myself were candid enough to declare that i was the best lad that had ever been in the house during their time there was one elderly lady a miss marigold who seemed to have taken a particular hatred for me and only because when one day she began to caress me in the same way that mrs beaumont and miss stacy had done i laughed in her face and told her to keep her wrinkled old hands to herself from that minute she grew desperately malignant against me and was always finding fault i determined to have my revenge and waited patiently for the opportunity that occasion came at last one evening miss marigold retired earlier to bed than usual and mrs turner rang for me in the parlour i went up and found my mistress alone john she said go directly with this box pointing to a round pasteboard one on the table to the hairdressers and tell him that you will call for it 
at eight precisely to-morrow morning then in the morning when you come back with it send it up by the housemaid to miss marigold's room i took the box which was tied round with string and was particularly light it immediately struck me that it must be miss marigold's wig for i was convinced she wore one accordingly as i went along the street i stepped up an alley and by the light coming from the window of a house unfastened the strings to peep inside sure enough it was miss marigold's wig it immediately struck me that her going to bed earlier than usual was only an excuse to be able to send her wig in time for the hairdresser to do it up that night and this circumstance joined to the fact that she wanted it the very next morning convinced me that miss marigold had but one wig belonging to her i therefore resolved that some accident should occur to the wig before it went back to her but in the meantime i took it to the hairdresser he seemed to understand what it was for without opening the box the strings of which i had carefully refastened he promised me that i should have the article when i came back in the morning shortly before eight i must now inform you that there was an elderly gentleman at the boarding-house whose name was prosser captain prosser he was called and a jovial kind of old bird he was too he was amazingly fond of breaking out now and then staying away all night and coming home between six and seven in the morning so precious drunk that he could not see a hole through a ladder but he was always sensible enough to know that he must not make a noise and when i let him in on these occasions he would put his forefinger by the side of his nose in such a comical fashion as much as to say don't let anybody know it that i could scarcely keep from laughing well on this very night when the affair of the wig occurred the captain went out for a spree and it happened that he came home rather later than usual the next morning i had just returned with the wig box and had it still in my hand when the captain's low sneaking knock at the door summoned me to open it he came in worse than i had ever seen him before he could scarcely keep upon his legs and his head rolled about on his shoulders just as if he had no bones in his neck at all his hat too was smashed completely in and his coat was slit completely up the back to the very collar such a comical figure i never saw in my life he staggered into the hall seeming quite to forget where he was or what he wanted there a thought struck me and i resolved to put it into execution he was so uncommonly drunk and yet so quiet and tractable that i saw i could do with him just as i liked so i led him into the parlour where the long table was laid for breakfast but no one had come down yet i seated him on the sofa in such a way that he could not fall off and in a few moments he was in 